Uh, well, I'm awake now. Semi-sober, I think. And, well, I'm ready to finish this for you guys, the internet, and whoever cares to hear my goddamn tale. So, why don't I just pick off where I started last time? As you recall, Mr. Mays had just died, and, well, I didn't find out that he even passed away until a good couple months after the funeral service. Initially, I was going to seek out his family in order to send my condolences, but upon reflection, it wasn't as if Mr. Mays and I were the best of friends, even in the best possible scenario I could think of. Hell, last time I talked to him, he was drunk off his ass in a bar and barely even recognized me. So, out of respect, I refrained. I continued through my college career, however, and I graduated a good year or so after the bar meeting. Graduating with English as my major wasn't a mistake per se, but wasn't exactly something that landed me a immediate job after college. However, I prepared for this. I saved a pretty solid amount of money while I was in school, and well, I felt I deserved a bit of a vacation, if you will. I took my spare cash, got together my college buddy Steve, and packed up and hit the road, aiming for somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. Now, the reason why I picked this area is because I lived near Littleton, Colorado when I was younger, and well, I remembered loving the area so very much. So this destination was as good as any. But you know what? The trip was a success. We made it somewhere around Estes Park, Colorado, and found a cheap cabin which we rented for a good month or so. The days were filled with lounging, hiking, and generally things that involve little to no work on our parts. But once our rental was through, we packed up and, well, headed our way back east. Now, here's where the interesting part comes in. Sometime during this trip, we had met up with a couple of Estes Park natives at one of the local bars. We never typically hung out with them or anything along those lines. We just, well, had conversations every now and again over drink and food once the liquor started to affect our common senses. One night, these guys were paying their tab and picking up awfully early, if you ask me. They usually were there into the wee hours in the morning, and uh, when we questioned them about it, they told us that they were having a little get-together with some friends of theirs, and they also invited us too. Now, us being stupid kids at the time, we figured that we had nothing else to do, so we hopped in a car and followed them to the party. Now, the party itself was very low-key and ultimately inconsequential to the story. However, the important thing to know is that at some point in the night, we were all sitting around a campfire swapping ghost stories amongst ourselves. At this point in my life, I wasn't exactly as much of a ham as I was in my younger years, but with a little bit of encouragement, I started on a couple of stories I remembered telling in my youth. Eventually, I made it to Mr. May's story about the showers. Now, every time I told it after hearing it from Mr. Mays, I'd spiced it up a bit, but out of some sort of subconscious respect from my former teacher, I went straight into the version he told in my class my sophomore year of high school. The group enjoyed the stories for the most part, the showers being the mutual favorite amongst the party goers. But, Sadly, me and Steve had to go at some point in the night, and we left for the cabin at around um, 5 in the morning. And on our way home, he asked me about the story. I told him all about Mr. Mays, that class, and my love for everything horror-related and whatnot. And, well, he suggested that we try to find a place on our return trip to New York. Initially... I was reluctant simply because I didn't feel like wandering around aimlessly in Nebraska for a few days. Uh, looking for some old farm building that was probably demolished, never existed, or possibly even a complete work of fiction. But a couple days of, well, a couple days before we left Colorado, I told Steve that it sounded like fun for some mysterious reason. We weren't going to, well, be able to do another trip like this for a long time, so I figured that, well, if we are going to pass through Nebraska, we might as well make the best of it. So, 
Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought this would be a little bit of a little bit of a tribute to Mr. Mays, a guy that, in retrospect, helped me realize that I honestly wanted to be a writer and all that kind of thing. So, anyway, we left for Colorado and made a long, boring, barren drive to Broken, Bro Broken Bow, Nebraska, or hell on earth, as Mr. Mays put it. We found a motel in the town and hung around for a couple of days, venturing out a hundred miles in any given direction or so each day after that. I had remembered Mr. Mays telling us that it was somewhere outside Broken Bow, but I don't think he really got any more specific on that, except for <laughs> his example of hick directions. Ten miles up the corn, take a ride on the corn, you get the picture. We tried asking the townsfolk if they had any information about the place known as the showers, but we were usually met with the same blank stares or eye rolling when we told them exactly what this place was. The only person who seemed to know anything about it was this older lady who worked at a gas station in the outskirts of town. Now, I don't recall her name, but this old woman was one of those cheerful older people who was very helpful and genuinely interested in what anyone had to say to her. Steve had started talking to her at the checkout when she asked us about our license plate, uh, commenting about the fact that we were very far from home. We had nowhere in particular to be, so Steve and I ended up talking to this woman for about 15 or so minutes trying to explain, and at which point we brought up our hunt for the place known as the showers. Initially, the name didn't ring any bells in this old woman's mind, which made sense, seeing as Mr. Mays had just given it a name after his experience there. But when I began to describe it in detail, the details that I remembered from the story anyway, the friendly old woman interrupted me. Her tone was now was not scornful or mean in any way, but she became very tense and deliberate, deliberate with her words from that point on. She said, people don't deal with anything relating to that sort of business around here anymore, she told us. That, that was just a long time ago, following her statements. She tried to attempt to be cheerful again, excusing herself to the restroom, and wishing us the best of luck in our return trip to New York. Steve and I had returned to the car without a word. Both of us were thinking about what that old lady said. Again, she didn't seem to be angry at all, but she just seemed to be in... Well, she didn't want to hear another word about it. We were driving back to the hotel before Steve said something. I mean, um... If I had to live in a place associated with an urban legend or something like that, I would totally mess with anyone who asks about it, he said. I mean, eventually you just get tired of people asking about it, and so maybe you just try to scare them and shut them up, wouldn't you? I agreed to Steve and kept on driving, but the whole experience wasn't sitting right with me. If this was some sort of well-known urban legend in this area, why did no one else in the town seem to understand what in the hell we were talking about? But after some time, I managed to put it off to the back of my mind. Now, mind you, neither of us were scared of finding the showers. This little excursion on our road trip was more like a scavenger hunt, a cap off to a overall relaxing vacation. Steve and I were basically like tourists, hunting for the site in which this famous movie was filmed, or something like that, I would assume. We went into the whole situation with little to no expectations, and a fleeting hope that we might be able to see a glimpse of this place. We spent another day in Broken Bow before we took our next trip to find the showers. Now, Nebraska isn't that terrible of a place as people make it out to be, but I will admit, it really isn't all that exciting. We found a bar and spent some time there, and that was about the extent of our activities on our day off. When we did get back on the road, we decided that we would attempt to stay off the main roads for as much of the day as we could. 
I knew there was no way that this place was going to be off of a highway, and I remembered some detail about a dirt road in Mr. Maze's story, so we went looking for those. This was fairly a futile effort. Most of Nebraska's roads are dirt roads, so <laughs> it didn't really help us that much. It was seven in the evening when we came upon a small but thick forest. I use the term lightly, but <laughs> for Nebraska, this place was like an, an oasis. The trees were full and thick, shrouding most of the insides in darkness. The sun was setting, and even though we had run into a few of these random crops of trees, we agreed that this one showed more promise than any of the others. There wasn't really any road, but there looked like a path where a dirt road might have been at some point. So we drove along that. If the car was able to handle the Rocky Mountains, a dirt path in Nebraska wasn't going to give us any trouble whatsoever. We moved slowly and carefully along the trail, making sure to clear any fallen trees and rocks in the road that may render our car useless. When the sun finished setting, well, let, let, let's just say that if this place was dark during the day, when it came to night, it was something else entirely. I had an inkling at this point that we may have found the right place, but I didn't want to jinx it, so we just continued onward. I didn't realize that at the time, but the little bits of light that managed to penetrate the canopy in this miniature forest actually did make it look like the tree branches were trying to grab the car just like in Mr. Maze's story. I'm still convinced they made up the part about the animalized though. Th the most aggressive creature we saw in this forest, or wood, or anything like that, was a dead rabbit on the side of the trail. It didn't have any obvious signs of death, it just looked like it simply lay there and never bothered to get up. We drove around in the darkness for quite a while before we found a clearing. We had moved several smaller clusters of branches out of the way before, but right in front of our exit was a giant, dead monster of a tree. There was no way we were moving this one. So we got out, turned on the bright headlights in the hope that it may illuminate the area in front of us. There was a general feeling of excitement, which mixed strangely with the sense of fear when I saw what laid 50 feet beyond the clearing. Right there, partially lit by the headlights of the car and a little bit from the crescent moon, was what appeared to be an old barn house. This wasn't a typical farmhouse, it was larger than the barns that I had seen in the films, and it didn't have any sort of crest. Basically, it looked like a small wooden warehouse. I wasn't entirely sure at this point if this was the place we were looking for, but this definitely was the closest that we had come. I moved through the brush until I was roughly about 20 feet from the entrance, at which point all the growth seemed to stop. I don't know if the owners had done something to the soil or the structure around it, but the whole structure had a border around it that was clear of any sort of plant life. I approached the entrance of the building, and when I did, I noticed a large sliding door, same as in the story. And then, as soon as I noticed that, Steve came up right behind me with two flashlights in hand. <laughs> so you're just gonna run into the place alone in the dark? He laughed, and I also gave my own half-hearted little chuckle, and grabbed one of the lights from his hand. Mine was little, but pretty bright nonetheless. It was the kind that hitchhikers most likely would have fastened to their backpacks just in case they're stranded in the middle of the night. It worked well enough, though, for the purposes that we're using it for. Um, at that point, I grabbed the metal door with both hands holding the flashlight in my mouth, and I gave it a tug. It moved slightly, creaked a little bit, but there was no way in hell I was going to be able to do this myself. Steve came up from behind, noticing my struggle, and set his flashlight on the ground and then grabbed the door. And once that was done, I counted one, two, three, and pulled the door with all the might that we could muster. But once we had, we only managed to move it a couple of inches. It must have a latch on the back of it because it slid very easily, stopping hard with a loud echoing, well, echo when it was completely open. 
Steve picked up his flashlight and walked behind me. I had already moved inside at this point. The inside of the structure was exceptionally bare, almost troublingly so. I wasn't exactly how, well, how far we were from the nearest home or small town, but there wasn't even the slightest bit of evidence that someone had been in this building for years. No broken beer bottles, empty trash bags, chips, anything along those lines. There wasn't even any animal droppings or, well, egg or plants that managed to grow inside of here. The room was expansive to say the least, larger than your average farm, but not warehouse size either. <laughs> it's really hard to explain, but um, I believe Mr. Mays had described it in his story. Um, I was sure that it was simply a holding area for farming equipment or something similar to that point. Disappointed, I wandered near the entrance while Steve ventured into the expansive darkness. As I was running over the details in the store, well, as I was running over the details of the story in my mind, something stuck to me like a sack of bricks. In Mr. Mays' story, there was a silo near the barn. I ran outside, my eyes adjusting easily because at this point, it was well brighter outside than it was inside. I looked in all directions, running around the perimeter of the building. Surely. If there ever was a silo near this place, there would be evidence of it somewhere. But despite my hopes, there was nothing but a cluster of thick branches on one side, and a brush of dirt, well, and brush and dirt everywhere, and the forest we had come from. I walked back to the building, frustrated, tired, and in a general bad mood. However, Steve was still excited, eagerly running around the inside of the barn. <laughs> Even if I could just find a showerhead or pipe somewhere around here, then we'd know it was true. Just, 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 just bear with me, just, just keep on looking, he stated. I didn't want to ruin his excitement, and uh, I had told Steve the story several times, but obviously, he didn't realize that this wasn't the place. The building was weird, yes, it was out of place and oddly pristine, yes, but... It wasn't the location of the showers. I let him explore a bit before I called him over. Uh, mate, um, how do I explain this? This was probably as close as we're gonna get, man. But this isn't it. Remember the silo? His face went from excitement to disappointment in almost an instant. Much like a young child who didn't get presents he wanted on his birthday. I patted him on the shoulder and said, <laughs> It was pretty cool though, man. I mean, well, we could still tell people we found it. I was reverting back to my old habits very quickly. <laughs> yeah, man, um, uh, I, I guess we could. It's definitely creepy enough. We should uh, get some pictures as proof, you know? And I agreed with him. All, all right, man, Um, let me grab my camera real quick out of the car. He stated as he bolted out of the entrance of the building. I was left alone. It was very quiet when I was alone there. I could hear the faint sound of Steve running through the brush and into the car, but once he was far enough away, everything went quiet. I remember not even hearing the wind or the chirping of crickets as I walked deeper into the dark, flashlight in hand. I was convinced that there had to be something. I approached the far corner of the, room, of the room, and the sound of my feet scratching against the dirt, interrupted by a soft, hollow thud. I stopped, trying to figure out what the fuck that was. I put my foot hard down against the ground again, and sure enough, I heard it again. I stopped once more, realizing that the floor I was standing on was covering something hollow. I walked to the wall of the room, looking carefully at the floor to try to spot any holes or gaps or something. As far as I had known, it was solid ground that this thing sat atop, so I was convinced that I had found a hatch or a basement or something. I heard Steve coming back through the brush as I shouted, Hey! Hey, Steve! Steve, come over here! Hey! As I, well, went to say something hollow, I hope, well, <laughs> I hopped a little bit, hoping to recreate the sound that he would be able to hear upon opening the door. The second my feet made contact with the floor, I, I felt it give out beneath me. 
The memory of the fall is fuzzy, but I do recall hearing a wood splinter. And I remember seeing a light from Steve's flashlight falling away into complete darkness. It wasn't a long fall, but I must have fallen in a terrible position because I know I lost consciousness for several seconds at the very least. When I woke up, I was staring at a bright light, and for an instant, I had thoughts about approaching the fabled lights at the end of the tunnel. I was angry at myself. You, you died in Nebraska, Jack? Wow. <laughs> you know how to fuck it up very easily. My self-deprecation in the afterlife was interrupted by what sounded like Steve's voice. Jesus, Jack! Can, can you hear me? Dude! Wake up! Come on! He screamed at me. I managed to lift my head up just off the floor, just enough for him to celebrate. The pain in my head was immense, but it was outweighed by the pain shooting through my goddamn knee. I knew I had a concussion, but the pain in my knee was just... <laughs> just so much more pressing. I looked around until, well, I found my tiny flashlight and, well, then sat up and reassured Steve. Okay. Fuck it. Ugh. Fuck my I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I just uh, hurt my knee. And I think I bumped my head too. Ugh, really hard. <laughs> Thank fuck, man. I, I thought you were dead. I imagine. Imagine that though. Dying in fucking Nebraska. It'd be awful. His words made me laugh a little bit, but I stopped myself. The slight. The slightest shaking hurt my head and made me feel incredibly dizzy. Uh, I, I guess, uh, a rope? Said Steve. What? Hey, sh should I get some rope to get you out of here, or do you see a ladder? I looked around at the walls and uh, that sat in front of me. They were smooth cement, and there was no way in hell I was climbing out of here. Yeah, get a rope. It's... Oh, fuck. It's buried under all of our stuff, I think, and it might be in the red climbing bag, but I'm not sure. Steve nodded, telling me to hang on, and then he ran off. The silence that followed was uncomfortable. After the sound of Steve's feet scampering off the floor above me had faded away, the only thing I was able to hear was buzzing. The, the, the buzzing that occurs in total silence intertwined with the pulsing, pulsating head I happen to own. I pushed myself over to the nearest cement wall and braced myself against it, resting and getting a deep breath in an attempt to calm myself. The cement was unnaturally cold against my back. It was summer, so I only had a t-shirt, but it felt like ice through all that. Again, this observation was primarily made after the fact. In the moment, it felt good to lean against something. I sat there, waiting for Steve in this godforsaken on the ground basement, and I began to feel uneasy. I felt like an idiot for falling down here. I felt the pain from my injuries as well, that... But that all seemed to fade into one in motion. In an instant, when I heard what I only could identify as breathing somewhere to my left, I, I convinced myself that it was my injured mind playing tricks on me, but for a few moments, my mind decided to rapidly replay Mr. Maze's story. When I heard, when I had first heard it in the, that classroom years ago, I was impressed more than I was really scared, but now... I was sitting in a dark basement in the middle of Nebraska, and I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. It couldn't even be summed up in the word fear. As I sat there, I felt this all-encompassing dread. I pointed my flashlight to the left, in the direction in which I thought I heard the sound. The light didn't reach any other wall, it was too far away, but... I was comforted to see absolutely nothing there. <sighs> I breathed deeply for a couple of seconds before I heard another noise in the darkness. It was very quick, but I couldn't be sure what it really was. Or was it my own body moving around without noticing? But I thought I heard a scream.
scrapping or scraping sound not 10 feet in front of me. It sounded like that noise that your feet makes when you're walking across a dirt-covered floor. Before I could even react, I heard a breathing to my left again, but this time incredibly close. There was no way that this was real. I, I had... I had seen so much, if, if I hadn't seen so much as a spider web in that direction, but now I was convincing myself that there was something right next to me breathing. I was angry at myself, getting very worked up. I told myself that it's the human brain constantly hallucinating. I, I told myself that while in the silence or in the dark, that the brain makes sounds to fill the gap or make you think you see things that aren't there. So I channeled my inner skeptic in order to calm myself and... It worked. It worked until I saw a flash of something in front of me. I couldn't be entirely sure what it was, but I heard the accompanying sounds of feet scraping against the floor, and I began to swell with dread. I decided that the best course of action at this point was to turn on my flashlight, assuming that, well, turn off my flashlight, assuming that they couldn't see me, that they couldn't get me, whatever they might be. I turned off my flashlight. And I was left in the complete and total darkness for the remainder of the time. The bulb of the flashlight faded and cooled as it sat in my pocket, simultaneously pushing it back against the cold cement wall in an attempt to stand. I managed to get myself on my feet. Well, foot. I found that I couldn't stand or put any pressure on my injured knee. I limped to the corner, humming to myself, trying to break the deafening silence. I then called for Steve as loud as I could manage, but I heard no response. He was probably back in the car hunting for some goddamn rope. There had to be a ladder or something in here somewhere. I continued to hum, and my heartbeat, which had been beating almost out of my chest at this point, slowed to a manageable rate. I moved along the cement wall, keeping my whole body against it and the weight off my injured knee. I had traveled... <laughs> I had traveled what I guessed to be about 10 feet when my head made contact with something in front of me. I tumbled to the ground. My concussion must have amplified in fucking pain because it was fucking blinded. I reached both hands for my forehead when I felt something warm and wet on my fingers. I searched for a cut anywhere on my forehead and I couldn't find one. I desperately searched my flashlight and sat up again trying to put my back against the wall. I grabbed my light in my right hand, bracing against the wall with the other, and I turned it on and pointed it into the darkness where I just hit my head. The floor is wet, but the dirt had muddled, had muddled in the color of whatever the liquid was. I tried to get my eyes open to focus on the puddle. I tried to convince myself that it was my blood when I saw another drop fall into the puddle. Words lacked the ability to describe the way I felt when I heard the <laughs> noise. And I saw yet another tiny ball of liquid fall into the puddle. I, I, I think I, I knew even then exactly what the source was. but. I was, endlessly, I was endlessly trying to give in so myself that I was wrong. I lift the flashlight, I lift the flashlight up and pointed it at the source of liquid. What I saw stare back at me was a pipe that protruded at least a foot out of the cement wall. The metal was rusted, cracked, little bits of liquid began to sleep, seep from them. At the end of the pipe was a simple shower head aimed towards the ground. You know when your stomach drops? In this case, I think mine literally did, because I vomited immediately after that and got it all over my shoe. But to be honest, that was at least a bit important to me at the time. I ignored my pain in my knee and I shuffled along against the wall as fast as I possibly could. I heard noises, but I couldn't be sure if it was the sound of my own movement or something around me. I managed to duck under the next shower head. This one was higher up on the wall though, but it seemed to be leaking the same damn liquid as the other one was. I, I felt like I was moving along something infinite. Every now and again, I would have to duck or move under a metal bar or another shower head. I don't fucking know. They began to pour more profusely though. The liquid was too thick, however, to come out that easy, considering it was almost gelatinous in nature. The room itself began to smell, and I remembered immediately the way that Mr. Mays had described it. The worst smell you could even think of. Uh, I grabbed my shirt, put it over my nose, tucking onward, but 
that didn't stop the smell for an instant. It smelled like vomit. It smelled like shit. It smelled like burnt hair. It smelled like rot. I was moving against a wall when I fell onto some sort of outlet and I hit the dirt ground really hard, adrenaline now coursing through my veins. But the pain managed to break through and through. My flashlight was still in my hand and I aimed it and examined my surroundings. Apparently, I was sitting in front of a doorway. There was a door there, though it looked aged now. It had a nice design on it, a doorknob and a knocker that looked like a snarling demon. The red paint was peeling from it, just like Mr. May's story, flaking off and falling to the ground right in front of me. I calmly rose and busted through the door, narrowly missing a piece of a hanging sheet of metal in front of me. I was now crawling. There was no way I could run. The walls and the ceiling were lined with metal. The kind that you would see on the roof of a farm. Large pieces of wood that seemed to brace the sheet, hiding the makeshift tunnel together. I, I couldn't risk sliding against that and cutting myself, just like in the story or hitting the wood, causing a cave-in. So I crawled. I, pu I pulled myself for what seemed like miles, running into walls every now and again because the path seemed to fucking curve like a snake. I had no idea where I was in relation to the hole that I had initially fallen in through, but I told myself that there was an exit at the end of this. Had I not been crawling, though, I would have surely have hurt myself or far worse. <sighs> Let me try to explain this. It hadn't caved in because the ceiling still lined it. Someone, some sick fucker, built it like this. This, again, is in hindsight. I didn't care at the time. I kept telling myself there was nothing behind me, but I swore I heard this scraping only a few inches behind my own. My jeans would brush up against my legs every now and again, making it feel like someone was touching me. And even now, I still cannot completely convince myself that someone wasn't. I crawled, and I crawled through until I reached a upslope. With joy, I looked ahead of me. There, right there, was the cellar door. The door was made of wood, and I knew this because I could see it through the light through them. I couldn't be sure, but I thought it might have been a light of the car or the headlights or something besides that. I was just, just so immensely happy to find the exit. I crawled through... Uh, I crawled all the way to the cellar door and threw my shoulder onto it. Uh, it. It budged, but it didn't open. I began to scream, and my throat started to sneer with pain. At the most I could manage was a harsh crying noise. It sounded like a dying animal. Just like in the story. I collapsed in exhaustion and pain, my eyes staring up into the slits of light before me. I couldn't, I was, I was so close to being out of here, I could taste it! It was in that moment of silent defeat that I heard what the noise was, without question. Something moving in the tunnel, it sounded like something was being dragged across a floor. It wouldn't move, it would move, then it would pause for a second, and then it would move again. I had nothing at this point left to throw up, but I begun to gag. I gathered myself slightly and tried to steady my hand enough to focus the flashlight into this tunnel. What I saw, I still cannot rationalize this very day. And you know what? I know what I saw, but I cannot convince myself that it actually was there. I can't stop telling myself that it was a hallucination. I saw a child in a dirty sleeping gown. The gown was stained in something dark and rusty brown with the occasional splashes of deep red. The child was extremely frail, like those pictures you might see of a holocaust victim. I could only make out one eye briefly reflecting in the light of my flashlight in between the tufts of the very long, dirty hair. It reached down beyond the fingertips of this kid, which were cracked with dirt. The boy or girl, I'm not entirely sure which, and I don't fucking care to be honest, moved towards me with difficulty. It wasn't breathing hard, but it seemed like every movement of every muscle took every ounce of strength this kid had. 
thing that froze me, though, was the eye. It was only visible because it was reflecting off my flashlight, but in that glint, I could feel anger or a deep hatred or something like that. This, this is the point in which my English language really lacks words right now to explain the situation. I could tell that this child meant harm. Whether it was a hallucination or not, the thing was getting closer and I started to cry. <laughs> yeah, I did. It was getting closer and closer when I heard a voice come from behind me. Hey, Whispered a voice. It was Steve, I was certain. I tried to talk back with fully intending to say, Open this shit up and get me out of here now! However, given my current state, I am sure I sounded like gargle nonsense. I crawled at the door, pushing against it with everything I had, finally breaking eye contact with the child as I did this. The flashlight rolled down the slope, coming to a rest somewhere near the child's feet. What do you see? What are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? I closed my eyes. I remember hearing a reply along the lines of, but my own screams of frustration drowned it out. I was mumbling like a maniac when a voice told me in a nice, calm voice, Rest for a second. I'll get it. The statement took a second to settle in, at which point I closed my eyes tight. Steve, Steve, just, just do it, please! Please just get the damn thing open, I whimpered. Uh, just, just get me out of here. The voice was beginning to get louder and louder. Steve, god damn it, open the fucking wooden door! I opened my eyes for just a second, for just a split second to see nothing but black hair dangling in front of my face. The small glint of light hidden in the mess of the tangles. I, I slammed my eyes shut and I screamed of every ounce of energy I had. Open the fucking door! The door behind me gave way and I fell into the dirt, taking a breath of fresh air in. My eyes were still closed, but the first thing I, de I did is that I scrambled to find the cellar door to close it. Once I had done this, I took a deep breath and opened my eyes. I saw the barn right in front of me, illuminated by the headlights of my car. My, my brain was pulsating with pain and, to be honest, my, my shirt and face and everything was just covered in dirt and liquids that I didn't even know what the fuck they were. I, I didn't even care about the origin. My knee was, at the very least, dislocated, but despite that, I was out of the tunnel. I took a deep breath, buried my face in my hands, and said, Steve, why couldn't you just open the fucking door? I waited for a response, but none came. Steve, seriously, I'm fucking crawling and screaming for my life, I said as I looked directly behind me. My stomach must have been on the verge of falling out of me at this point because it shifted again. The only thing that be was behind me was a large mass of brush and I I, I don't even know what the, the, how to explain this. Um, the thing that was behind me was a large mash of brush that I had seen in a well that I seen while examining the perimeter of the building. I was angry. Steve, this is not the fucking time. Come out of the brush. I'm getting ready to stand up here and fucking yell at you in front of this building. A flashlight bobbed up and down of the semi-darkness. Steve was running into the open door of the structure, yelling my name, telling me not to worry. I must have lost consciousness at this point, because when I woke up, Steve was standing over me, desperately trying to wake me up. His words were almost incoherent, at least to my ears. He helped me to my feet, and I began to walk to the car. As we walked away, I saw my flashlight just sitting on the outside of the cellar door. The light was fading. Steve brought me back to the car and drove me to the nearest hospital. I fell asleep, but he told me that he drove for around an hour before he found a main road. I don't think I ever told him the whole story, and I believe he thinks that, well, I was just injured from the fall, and he never really asked about it, and we didn't stay in contact for much longer. It's not like we deliberately parted ways, we just sort of stopped hanging out with each other after that trip, and... Uh, just kind of went our separate ways after that. 
I've never been able to fully understand what happened that night, whether that was an unconscious hallucination or something else, but there are many things that I can't explain away as being hallucinations, but this... There, there, there's just things that don't make sense. The shower heads were leaking something. That the door was real. The tunnel was real. Most everything else was semi-rationalized. If I just, I, I can't convince myself that I had a bad concussion or a very, very bad hallucination. But one thing that I couldn't have imagined was that cellar door was locked then instantly wasn't. I'm still skeptical as I had ever been, but I believe what happened to me at the showers was, well, different. I'm not a hermit or a social retard because of this. I do drink a lot, but I'm, I'm still functionable. <laughs> but I will never return to Nebraska. No one <laughs> will ever be able to convince me otherwise. I don't watch horror movies, and I, there's absolutely nothing entertaining about being desperately scared in that way. That's it. It Really, there, there's no typical ending for this story. I, I just kind of changed. I was just kind of changed by my experiences. Yeah, but there's no way to change anything about it or fight back against it. I can't even convince myself that I wasn't just seeing things. Believe me, I've been, I've been trying for years. Prior to this... Uh, there really was no way to find information on the showers. The legend didn't extend outside of my classroom of Mr. Mays. And no one told stories like this to keep the children away from the certain place or scare them out of the town. It just wasn't known. I guess that they're really... Th that's really the point of the story. I want people to know firsthand that this... Well, what this place is like. Maybe it's a drunk's, um, ration tale, or the kid inside me wanting to spread these kinds of stories again. I don't know. I don't care. But it's out there, and now people can mold and wrap their needs around it. Most importantly, it's out of my head. It's getting late. I'm getting another drink. Cheers.